Okay, great. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our last meeting of 2018. Can you believe the year's over? Wow. Thanksgiving's next week. Anyways, um, yeah, so this part of our meeting is an informational part of our meeting. How many of you, it's your first time here at our meeting? Well, welcome. I think we have some students back here, right? From Okay. Also, um, we have our um, some volunteers from De Anza College. Raise your hand. I think Juan is still out in the lobby. So they came early and helped us set up, and they're doing volunteer work for the communications class, and one of them's in uh, intercultural class, and also uh, part of the NAMI on campus at De Anza College. So thank you to our volunteers. Um, also, Pat Bell, who's in the back, um, is here. She comes to most of our meetings, and she's a volunteer also. Um, if you wanted to check your membership, see if it's still active or if you want to join. It's not required, but, you know, numbers count. So um, you can see Pat. She, she comes to our meetings. So, so first I want to um, have our walk manager, uh, Shauna, come up. And anyways, Barbara, do you want to come up too? She's one of the top ten teens here. So... Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Shauna Webb, and I am the Development Director and NAMI Walks Manager. And I just wanted to say for how many of those participate in NAMI Walks? Oh, yay. This is fabulous. We had a great walk season so far. For 2018, we have raised $305,714. Thousand seven hundred and fourteen dollars, which is a record breaker, and that's and that's uh, that's oh definitely to the work that you guys have put in to make Nami Walks a success. We had over fifteen hundred people register as walkers, and what a fabulous event! So we're going to do it again next year on September twenty first. Uh, 2019, same time, same place, Arena Green West here in beautiful downtown San Jose. So we hope those of you who have not joined NAMI Walks, please come out, uh, show your support, and we look forward to seeing you. And I'm going to pass this mic over to Barbara real quick, who uh, is the team captain for uh, one of our top fundraising teams at NAMI Walks. Okay, the name of my team is Brave Hearts, and there are a few of you in the audience that are on my team, and thank you for that. Some great fundraisers. And we raised ourselves, we raised a little over $12,000. So on to next year and bigger and better things. And thank you, Kathy, for pointing that out. There's still time to donate to uh, NAMI Walk Silicon Valley. Uh, we have up until November the 22nd to continue raising money. So feel free to donate at www.namiwalks.org slash Silicon Valley, or if you can't remember that, you can just simply go to our page, where at the top corner you'll see it says NAMI Walks. That will take you directly to the donation page, where you can simply make a donation directly to the page, a secured page. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, just a little background on our classes. Um, for how many here have taken either family to family, peer to peer, basics? Okay, several people here. Um, so this is one of the things that we offer free to the community that is invaluable. That's why most of us are at NAMI volunteering or working, uh, doing presentations, teaching, whatever. So um, the family to family classes are ending. Um, the week right after Thanksgiving, as well as I think there's a peer-to-peer -peer class ending the same week. Uh, we just finished a basics class, which is uh, for families who are dealing with 
children generally under the age of 18. Um, that's a six-week course. We just finished that last Saturday. Um, Homefront now, which is for veteran and military families, is an online course. So I know they started that at the end of October. So uh, there'll be another one coming up probably in, in late January um, if anybody wants to take that class. And then we have ongoing provider education classes for people who are working in the mental health field, substance use, um, uh, running board and care homes, a variety of you know people uh, from the community to learn about how they can really understand the lived experience of family members and, and also clients and how to have a, a collaborative model of care. So um, those are free because our county sponsors those. If any of you qualify, you can contact our office and we can get you on an interest list. Um, just a reminder, there's no meeting in December. And um, so, but that doesn't mean we're not doing anything. We have our holiday drive. How many of you know about our holiday drive? So, so that's starting now. And um, we, we're looking for donations uh, for a variety of things. It's on our website. Um, if you travel and you get those t small toiletries from hotels, great time to donate them to us because <laughs> we make up little uh, bags for people. We, we do about, last year I think we did 650 bags and they went out to uh, self-help centers, uh, veteran homes, some of the larger uh, board and care homes, people who are in the hospital, uh, quite a variety of people. And we usually have a pair of socks, a uh, pocket calendar, we put in candy, goodies. Um, we, you get a, also either a, a handmade scarf. We have a lot of people who knit throughout the year. And so they're handmade scarf or pair of gloves or um, what's the other one? Hats. Hats. So those are some of the donations, Play, playing cards. Um, this year we have a lot of cliff bars and zone bars left over from our walks. So we don't need any bars, so we have plenty of those. And then the other thing is $5 um, gift cards for like Starbucks or Jamba Juice, um, McDonald's, that sort of thing. So anyways, um, that's starting now. And you can also order on Amazon. We have a list, a wish list, and a lot of people do that. And again, it's on our website. Or you can contact the office. We can send you a flyer. Um, let's see. The other thing I want to talk about is FaithNet. So... How many of you know about our efforts with FaithNet? Anybody? A few people. So this is something that was started about 20 years ago by a couple people in California to do outreach to faith communities, to educate them about mental illness, and it's now in, you know, part of a national effort. Um, it's not a program that gets a lot of funding, so you know, we started a few years ago having lunches um, at our office and inviting people from different faith communities. Um, it turns out that a lot of people who came to those those um, lunches actually had taken our classes, family members and clients, and they they are the ones that did the recruiting. And we had about seven lunches, and we told them about the services we had. They heard the lived a story of from a client, from a family member, and also the person who runs the program is um, a pastor herself that experienced mental health challenges. So. Um, you know, that was kind of the basic, just, you know, mental health 101 and learning about some resources. And out of that, we've seen a lot of um, different communities, the Catholic Church in particular, they brought several people to these lunches, and they actually had a symposium a couple years ago with really good speakers, and they started a mental health ministries, and now even their bishop, you know, they talk about mental health. And the, the, their mental health ministries is actually becoming part of Catholic charities. So it's kind of interesting to see just a small group of people who are interested in this. They can make a lot of big changes. So this year our landlord gave us a grant for $40,000. And um, so we have a part-time outreach. And we have selected 10 different congregations. I think we have six right now. And, you know, it is to work on a strategic plan for that community to bring mental health, you know, to um, their congregations. Um, because a lot of faith leaders, you know, they don't have a clear understanding of what mental illness is and isn't. And this is a really 
good opportunity for them to learn. And just as they would recognize somebody maybe having a heart attack or, uh, you know, some other medical condition, we want them to become aware of, you know, someone who's, you know, showing mental health symptoms. And um, instead of just saying, I'll pray for you, which, you know, we all need the prayers, but we wouldn't do that if someone was having a heart attack. We would say, oh, my gosh, we need to get you some help. And to try to normalize it, you know, with the person and, um, you know, have resources for that person so that encourage them to get the, involved in some kind of treatment. So this has been going on since July. And, again, we're seeing very good results um, with uh, several congregations and uh, they, they're making plans for next May. May is Mental Health Awareness Month to do sermons about mental health uh, with, with our Cindy McCallum, Reverend Cindy McCallman, uh, working with them. So we're, we're very excited about where this is going. And also our county is just putting out a, an RFP to expand this, so we're going to apply for it. We don't know if we'll get it, but we'll sure try, and we have a little experience. So anyways, I just wanted to mention that. And I see someone in the back here. Hi, Senator Bell. How are you? You want to come down and say hi to everybody? He's on a break from his his work, so we're going to... Does everybody know who Senator Bell is? He's, so you should. This guy has done a lot of for us in California, creating mental health legislation and awareness. Thank you for coming tonight. Hi. Hi. Well, I'm essentially here to hear the lecture, so I don't want to cut into the time. So, um, Also, um, I'll make a pitch for the membership if you haven't signed up. My wife's sitting out at the table over there, Pat, so please go and uh, join NAMI. She's out at the table, my wife, Pat. Um, this year was a pretty good year for mental health, uh, although the governor vetoed 40 mental health bills. So we lost the, the peers. We had we had a 40 to zero vote in the Senate and an 80 to zero vote on um, setting up a peer certification program for California a statewide program. And they vetoed the bill. Then we have a youth uh, uh, health care in school, mental health care in schools. He vetoed the bill. Um, the one where you can get a referral the same day if you have a physical illness and you go to your doctor and you want to get an appointment to a mental health provider the same day, he vetoed the bill. So we're, okay, so he's gone. <laughs> okay, <laughs> basically. Uh, and we have Governor uh, Gavin Newsom's elected. Gavin Newsom, probably a good thing to do is to check out his website and look at the statements he made on mental health so you can kind of understand. He's a little uh, more, he wants to be more proactive on the mental health issue. In fact, he had a kind of a listen session in San Francisco a couple weeks ago. And um, he's uh, going to be very active in mental health. I think the thing we want is we want to see some family-oriented support, family support kind of person appointed to be his key advisor on mental health issues. That's the, that's what we're in the legislature, because now he's hiring people, and who he hires is very important in terms of how they provide the mental health services for the state of California, right? So they will be his key advisors. So essentially, uh, uh, and I've communicated with him that we want somebody, a key advisor he can trust and that he can be close to uh, and um, care about mental health issues. So um, that's what we're trying to do now. The other thing I'm doing is i developing my legislative package. I'll have at least, it looks like, four bills that I will be dealing with with mental health. I'm going to try to cover parity, uh, uh, some, uh, some kind of enforcement for that with the insurance companies. And uh, I'm looking at uh, a bill with uh, youth in schools. I want to reintroduce the peer, the peer uh, certification uh, program because I think that's, you know, 48 states have already done that. California is one of two states that has it. So we kind of thought, well, this should be a slam dunk. The governor will sign this bill, but he didn't. He vetoed it. And um, 
the last one I'm looking at is a uh, bill that would establish uh, youth drop-in centers in California for young people, you know, like a comprehensive youth drop-in center program. So those are what I'm working on. There's a lot of other legislators that are working on other things. I'm, I'm a chairman of the Senate, the State Senate Mental Health and Substance Abuse Committee, and I'm also chair of the Senate uh, uh, Mental Health Caucus, and we have once a month we have lunches, and we invite the legislators and we have only legislators attend the lunches, and I have to buy them food, so that's why they come, you know. So, so it's kind of a trick. It's a good tactic. So uh, we, we meet in the lounge, and we have a speaker come in every month and talk about mental health issues. So the senators are educated about mental health. And we have one of the Stanford colleagues come in uh, to talk about youth psychology and the drop-in center and we got everybody all interested in that. Steve Adelson, Dr. Adelson. And, um, and so uh, for me, for me uh, that's a way of getting support, a support network. And now we're starting to invite the assembly members. By the way, in the Senate Mental Health Caucus, we usually have about 22 people show up for lunch in the legislature. That's quite a substantial number. And uh, about a third of them are Republicans. So it's a bipartisan it's one of the few areas that's a bipartisan area in Sacramento. There aren't too many, but that's one of them, is the mental health issues. So we have some strong Republicans that have done bills on mental health, too, as well as Democrats. Okay, thank you. I, I just wanted to let you know what I'm doing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Senator Bell. Okay, Beverly. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, speaker, Dr. Carolyn Rodriguez, and she is with the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford School of Medicine. And her focus there is on obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD. Dr. Rodriguez is assistant professor of psychiatry. She's the director of, of the Stanford Translational OCD Research Program. Also, she is the vice chair of the annual IOCDF research, research Symposium. She's also the vice chair of the Council of Research of the American Psychiatric Association. And she's the recipient of the 2017 Eva King Killam Research Award for Outstanding Research Contributions. So please welcome, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you so much, Bev, for uh, the kind invitation. And it's uh, such a pleasure to be here. I um, moved from New York about three years ago. I was at Columbia and really enjoyed the vibrant community of NAMI there in New York. And uh, meeting Bev, and you, you guys know Bev, uh, the energy that she sort of radiates is like pretty amazing. And uh, so, so wonderful to see and hear all the announcements and all the wonderful work uh, that you're doing and uh, the work from the, um, the uh, government uh, as well, having Senate representatives and pushing forward bills. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful energy. And I'm delighted to talk to you today about some of the research that we've been doing in obsessive compulsive disorder that may actually lead to some inroads to other um, mental health conditions as well. So <clears throat> I'll start with some funding and disclosures. Um, you see uh, behind me a lot of things that I'm involved with. None of the um, medications and drugs that I'm going to talk about today um, I have conflict of interest. I will be talking about some investigational drugs, one called ketamine and one called rapastinel. And there was a drug, there's a drug rapastinel um, that the inventor donated to me and I got funding from uh, Brain and Behavior Research Foundation or NARSAT so I could pursue the study without bias. So today I thought I'd uh, review um, OCD first line treatments and talk about uh, the work that I've been doing in ketamine and research in ketamine and rapid acting therapeutics. And first, I just want to start with um, a thought experiment. So imagine you are hiking for hours and hours. You're incredibly thirsty, and you realize you forgot your canteen. 
and the only water lies in a toilet bowl. Would you drink? So I'm going to ask you to raise your hands in a moment. So, um, so in three categories. One, you would drink right away. Another category, you might pause, but you might ultimately drink. And the third category, no way, I would not drink from the water. Okay, so show of hands, how many people would drink right away? From the tank. From the tank. This is very clever. Just thinking outside of the box. I like it. I like it. This is a snappy group. <laughs> okay, how many people would pause um, but ultimately drink? Okay, that's a majority of you. And how many people would absolutely not drink from that? Okay, good. Solidarity, good. <laughs> um, for the middle group, for those individuals that paused, if you could volunteer as to why didn't you drink right away? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, and wh why not drink that, the water from the toilet bowl? Don't know. Don't know what's been there. You're weighing the advantages and disadvantages of what? Surviving. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Right, right. What, what would ha Yes, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Because because of what? Germs, right? Germs, contamination, right. So so thank you for volunteering that, sir. Um, and another, yes. Yes. Exactly. So some survival basics um, in the front row. Thank you so much, sir. So, um, so the, the idea is to get you sort of thinking because to somebody that has obsessive compulsive disorder with contamination, drinking from a regular water fountain may feel like drinking from a toilet. Um, and for a lot of us, this was a little pause that we had before making a decision. And for some people, and, and in this example for uh, contamination, if you add up all those little pauses that people have in the morning, making their breakfast, going out, all those pauses together, you can see how very quickly that would shift your timing. You would have to think about bringing water with you, um, you know, a lot of different kind of accommodations that could really disrupt your day and your life. What causes OCD? We don't know what causes OCD is the short answer. We, we, um, mental disorders like OCD are increasingly thought of as brain circuits gone awry. And in obsessive compulsive disorder, it's thought to be a hyperactive um, corticostriatal thalamic cortical loop. Um, I'm going to shorthand it as a thought control circuit. And it comprises um, the orbital frontal cortex here, which is important for planning and decision making. And then looping back to the striatum, which is important for behavior production. And then through the thalamus, the realization back to the orbital frontal cortex. And there's different hypotheses for why this circuit is hyperactive in OCD. Um, some thoughts are that it has to do with dysregulation of neurochemicals um, that allow our brain cells to communicate. Um, these are things like serotonin, glutamate, which is one of the main excitatory neurotransmitters. And increasingly, changes in glutamate are thought to be associated with obsessive compulsive disorder. So how do we treat OCD? So um, luckily for about half of individuals who have obsessive compulsive disorder newly diagnosed, they can be helped by two first line treatments. The first is um, cognitive behavioral therapy with exposure and response prevention. And the idea for this is, is that um, for individuals that have OCD, you have intrusive thoughts that cause anxiety and repetitive behaviors um, that relieve that anxiety. And um, part of it is, tr is uh, learning to have the anxiety come on board without doing the compulsion. And you can do a hierarchy of symptoms from least to most. And so an example of uh, contamination would be uh, maybe touching a doorknob with a tissue and then touching that tissue to your hand whereas all the way up might be putting your hand in a toilet in Grand Central Station. And so the idea is to unlink or unpair 
the idea that you have to do the compulsion with the behavior. But as you can imagine, facing your fear like that, um, for myself, I, I um, learned to swim as an adult, and I was terrified of going into the water. And it, the idea of just putting my foot in was terrifying. I needed a coach. Um, so you can imagine for people, that idea is to, to do something like that would be terrifying. And that's why um, it's um, important to find a good connection with the right coach or therapist. Um, this, the next first line treatment is serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And the idea for this kind of medication, these are things like Prozac, is that it helps boost the level of this neurochemical serotonin and helps the nerve cells communicate better. But serotonin reuptake inhibitors have side effects. They can have sexual side effects. Um, they can cause dry mouth. They can cause headache. Some people don't want to take medications. But for the people who can do these, it helps it roughly half. And there's also the combination of these two for cases where individuals have very uh, severe OCD. Approximately half will have improvement, but that also means another half won't. And that's really the focus of the research that I do in our lab, trying to help people who have tried these first-line treatments but still have residual symptoms um, or are not helped by them. Another challenge as a clinician and a frustration for me is that these first-line treatments can take on the order of months two to three months of individual suffering. And sometimes you have to try different kinds of treatments in order to be able to get relief. Second line treatments um, include switching to a different medication with serotonin in it, um, switching to another class of medication, and augmenting with a dopamine blocker or switching to effects or a Remeron. Now, you don't need to um, uh, memorize or remember all of these things. Um, there's wonderful resources, um, including the IOCDF website. Um, I belong to a group, um, the um, ADAA, where we have clinical practice guidelines that outline these algorithms. And also the APA has a very specific algorithm that you can follow as well. So third-line treatments, as you can see here, I won't go through all of them, but just to show you that there are a lot of different medication strategies that might help somebody with OCD. And for medic if medications have been tried, you can also try things like magnetic um, uh, stimulation. There's been recent FDA approval um, for um, uh, a device um, that has been approved for use in OCD. And Finally, um, there are, are also surgical options. So these are deep brain stimulation options as well. So again, this is, the, this is I think, what you need to know, that um, there's APA treatment guidelines that can be used, ADAA.org, IOCDF. And the key for treatment in speaking with your doctor or loved one is that it's, you need the right dose of medication. So unlike um, treating depression, where there's lower doses of SSRIs, OCD requires higher doses. And so a lot of people end up being underdosed um, and treated for OCD if they're being treated by community providers who don't know this. And you also need the right time. So in depression, you can get an effect in the, on the order of two weeks. But in OCD, actually, you need to give it about eight to 12 weeks. So again, some people don't have a sufficient trial. So, oh, yes, go ahead. Sir. Yes. Exactly. So about a quarter of cases start by age 14. And about half of cases will start by age 19. So it really disrupts um, the development um, to um, when, when the onset is early. There's some studies showing that early onset is also um, uh, associated with uh, typically a, a more difficult course as well. So um, with all of this I said, we're in need of hope. Depression and OCD are the leading causes of disability in the world. Depression affects 16 million individuals. OCD affects on the order of 2 million people. And depression, um, this number is staggering. It costs the U.S. E economy um, $210 billion, um, per year in lost productivity missed days of work and care for uh, related illness. So we need people in the back like the senator uh, advocating for us and, and, and really making a difference in inroads in, in, in this disorder. 
So can we do better? Can we cure OCD? So what I would say is in order to do this, we really need to understand the fundamental building blocks. How and where in the brain are obsessions encoded? Um, what goes awry and how can we treat it more precisely? Um, in, in other disorders, neurological disorders, there's a disease, there's a definition of a disease. And in OCD, we don't know exactly how the brain functions even um, to be able to, to, to intervene. So I wanted to talk to you about some of the work um, that I have been doing in terms of a drug called ketamine, which is FDA approved at higher doses for um, adults and children for anesthesia. And in lower doses um, is thought to, to change levels of glutamate. So that's one of the neurochemicals that I talked about that was associated with OCD. And I thought, you know, there's been some evidence that ketamine can rapidly help uh, depression. Could it actually be something that helps OCD? And there was some evidence from an animal model in which a glutamate protein if it's disrupted in an animal model, causes an animal model to groom excessively and is in a model of OCD-like repetitive behavior. And when you reinstate this protein in the striatum, in, within the thought control circuit, the mouse doesn't have those behaviors anymore. So it was suggested the glutamate um, could be um, important in the, in the pathophysiology of OCD. And so what we did was, um, we gave a single infusion of ketamine and um, a single infusion of saline. Each individual got two, two uh, doses of the saline. And individuals were uh, randomized to the order they got the infusion. So this is called a crossover study. And what's good about a crossover study is that you can actually combine the two phases of data and get more power. However, you can't have a carryover effect, meaning that you can't have the effects of one phase go on to another. And we actually did observe a carryover effect, um, meaning that ketamine was continuing to act even past uh, the time that we thought it would. And so what I'm showing you is just the results of the phase one data. And what we asked um, patients was on a scale of zero, zero to 10, 10 being constant intrusive obsessions and zero being none, please rate your symptoms. And we looked here, the screen box is the infusion. So we asked them before the infusion, and during and then after the infusion up to one week, how their symptoms were. So here, the top line is individuals that got placebo called saline, saline normal saline, and the other got 0 0.5 mix per kg of ketamine. And what you can see is a, a significant decrease right away within hours of OCD obsessions. And the um, half-life or the, the ketamine stays in the body for a short period of time and you could see the effect lasted past its, um, the time that it was in the body. And so that was pr very interesting to us. Also interesting is that these individuals were not on medication. So in fact, it was the first study that showed that you didn't need to have serotonin um, uh, modulation or change um, in order to see these very rapid effects. So what did it look like one week after? So about half of individuals reported significant changes in their OCD symptoms. This is measured by a scale called the Yale-Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. And what was it like? What was the experience for patients? So um, here are some quotes. Um, you know, people said that they felt like they had, were on, had a vacation from their OCD. Um, one individual tried to have OCD thoughts but couldn't. But there's side effects to ketamine. So individuals can experience nausea. They can have blood pressure and heart rate changes that are consistent with it. Um, they can have headache. And everybody who I've given ketamine to feels dissociated. They feel high, floating, super happy. Sometimes people feel like they have superpowers. All these changes go away by 110 minutes. So in summary, um, this gives us some sense that potentially glutamate can, could be a target uh, for rapid acting treatment of OCD. And um, I don't, how many of you have seen like some headlines about ketamine in the, in the news? No, so, some of you have, right? So Time had a thing about, you know, New Hope for Depression. Um, NPR has done some features on it. Um, 
And there's been our group, the American Psychiatric Association, did a meta-analysis and showed that in seven placebo-controlled trials for a total of 147 patients with depression, there's compelling evidence for its effects uh, as an antidepressant. Um, it's been given approximately to 400 adults, and it's thought to have these different um, mechanisms of action, maybe glutamate, maybe enhancing neuroplasticity. But there's some reasons for caution and why I don't recommend that um, individuals go to a ketamine clinics that have been, have been popping up. Um, so one is that the effects are transient. Um, for the individuals that we gave it to OCD, their symptoms came back after. And we don't know how to sustain those effects yet. That's part of our research. It has side effects. Ketamine is also called Special K. It's a drug of abuse. We don't know what the long-term effects are of repeated dosing as well. And recreational abusers can have bladder toxicity and cognitive problems. Those are people that have ketamine for big high doses for long periods of time. And there's variability at the clinics. Um, you know, I, I, I typically give people so like a list of questions and some reviews of things to, to ask and inquire. Um, sometimes people just feel like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I, I cannot stand this. I'm feeling suicidal. This is my only hope. You know, in those kind of very desperate cases, sometimes clinicians and patients come together and they, they think of this as a strategy. Um, but it's not yet approved for depression or for OCD. So we need more, we need more research. And there is hope, but there is also caution. And so I'm going to go through the research that I'm doing to target each of these um, issues. So first is that the ketamine's effects are transient. So one of the, one of the things that I thought of um, hypothesis-wise is that um, cognitive behavioral therapy is wonderful. But as I mentioned, it's difficult for people to do it. Could ketamine decrease people's symptoms enough for them to start engaging in cognitive behavioral therapy, which in and of itself doesn't have side effects? And could we just use it as a one-time? Um, also, extinction learning, so that learning that you don't have to do the behavior whenever you have the obsession, um, is a component of cognitive behavioral therapy. And we um, know through uh, different kinds of models that, um, that, that ketamine increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It helps with extinction learning. Um, it helps plasticity in learning. So could ketamine actually help people learn CBT better? So we did an open-label study, meaning that everybody got ketamine and everybody got intensive exposure and response prevention and over, over two weeks. And what we found is, again, we reproduced the very rapid effects of ketamine in these nine individuals. And when we did just 10 hours of cognitive behavioral therapy, so usually this is an intervention that takes months and months and months, we saw that 63% um, this time met treatment response criteria in two weeks which is an improvement from the 50% from the that we saw in one week. So we're getting a little bit closer. It wasn't the sort of like cure that I was looking for, um, but it's intriguing, and we're continuing to explore this as a possibility. So we're trying now different combinations of medications that could, that could maybe take the, the baton from ketamine and lower the symptoms but continue to have them. So that's one line of research. Um, so this is, this is just summarizing what I just said. Um, what's also interesting is I mentioned that ketamine also um, changes levels of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is important in learning and memory. And what's interesting is that, um, that in, your, um, in the genes, we can have mutations for BDNF. And when we look at those um, muta these mutations, so whether you have... Um, uh, uh, whether you're a carrier of a mutation or not. And we found that those individuals that had the BDNF mutations um, were not as responsive as individuals that had that intact. So suggesting that BDNF and learning and memory are important in these kind of processes. So another challenge is, like I mentioned, that ketamine has side effects. And so um, I went to a conference, and I had my eagle eyes open to see if there was any 
promising compounds out there that had some similar rapid action to ketamine but didn't have the side effects. And I met at a conference um, Dr. Joe Muscal, who is this uh, very sort of a stereotypical mad scientist, his hair, like white hair flowing and very animated in front of his poster. And I started talking to him about his research. And, you know, he, what, what was very intriguing is that he showed that in, in animal models, you could have these antidepressant effects. Um, and they, he went on in depression to show with 10 mg per kg, it could have these um, antidepressant effects, but without the dissociation, without the blood pressure changes. And I said to him, please, like, I got to try this in OCD. Um, and he very graciously donated the compound. Narset funded the study. And um, it, it is also an IV formulation. And it was a three to five minute push IV. And we asked, um, in addition to symptoms of obsessions, we also asked, asked about depression and anxiety. And we saw, again, this is all those scales together in a 230 minute time scale that over 90 minutes, these three symptoms decreased very rapidly. However, the effects weren't sustained. So um, they were sustained with anxiety, but for the, for the OCD symptoms, they didn't continue on to one week. So with ketamine, they were able to persist out to one week. With this compound, they didn't. It was remarkably well tolerated, and it suggests that, um, that rapastinel is tolerated, it didn't have the side effects of ketamine and did have acute effects, but, but really repeated dosing needs to be explored. So it would need to be dosed similar to, um, you know, uh, fluoxetine, Zoloft, these kinds of medications where you take, you know, reg regular medication. Um, the other exciting thing about this is, you know, after a few, after a few patients of a company um, bought um, the, the compound from the inventor, and um, they asked me to stop the study. I published those results. Um, they're available in the American Journal of Psychiatry. And the company then went on to develop this as a phase three first-in-class indication. And by next year, they will have the results of this large randomized study. And this could be the first um, new type of glutamate treatment for depression. Um, and in OCD, there hasn't really been any new drug developments uh, since the 1980s. So it's very exciting. And the nice thing is that the study that we published may be used by providers to advocate to the insurance to get reimbursement for rapastinel for use in their patients. So that's, that's a good outcome of this. We also don't know how ketamine is working. So I've been talking to you a lot about glutamate, um, but I'm a skeptic. I'm skeptic of others' work. I'm skeptic of my own work. I like to see reproducibility. I like to see large numbers. So I said for myself, you know, does actually giving ketamine change levels of glutamate in the brain? And we partnered with a group um, at Cornell and Columbia and to actually ask in the thought control circuit, in a region close to the orbitofrontal cortex. It's highlighted here, this little box here. Can we measure non-invasively using magnetic resonance spectroscopy changes in the neurochemical glutamate, and an excited, um, which is excitatory, and an inhibitory neurotransmitter called GABA? And to my surprise, glutamate didn't change at all in this re region of the brain. What changed was GABA which is inhibitory. It sort of dampens down the activity of circuits. So that's a, a wonderful thing about science. It always surprises you. So there's caveats with it, right? It's a small study. Um, I'm looking at one region of the brain. Um, but it suggests a possible mechanism that, it, it, that this compound could be increasing the inhibitory signal to dampen down the circuit. So we're now doing a five-year study funded by taxpayer dollars, um, the NIH, to be able to test this hypothesis, to look at ketamine versus midazolam in a large sample, to be able to replicate the findings um, and see if, it, see if it does work, what's the time scale of its effect, and how in the brain is it acting. 
Is it acting on neurochemicals? Is it acting on the thought control circuit directly? Is it working on the symphony and network synchrony of these cells firing together? Okay, so this is a summary. Um, so an another challenge is that ketamine is a substance of abuse. Um, and one of uh, the, the hypotheses of ketamine acting through the glutamate system is could it actually be working through the opioid system as well? And um, so beyond glutamate, ketamine acts through multiple systems, including opioid. And we wanted to study, again, mechanism. So we use naltrexone, which is an opioid, um, this is again a neurochemical, a blocker. And we did a study of um, a randomized crossover in which ketamine was infused once over two conditions, and participants received this opiate blocker uh, before one of the conditions. And this is the study design, and this is the team. And I think um, Nolan Williams came to sp speak to your group um, a while back. Yeah. Uh, so he, yeah, he's the first author of the study, and Boris Heifetz and Alan Schatzberg and I are the senior authors. Terrific team. And what we found, actually, was that when you pre-treat with an antagonist, we were able to completely eliminate the antidepressant effects, um, which was stunning. Usually you don't have robust uh, so, uh, results that are this robust. And interestingly, when you um, also when you pre-treat with the opiate, it didn't change the dissociative effects at all. So it, it doesn't seem to be, to be going through the opioid system. So in summary, the opioid system um, is, is activation is critical for ketamine's antidepressant effects. And how do, we, how do we reconcile this with prior research on glutamate? So one of the things that we know is that ketamine works quickly, the effects last, and then they, then they turn off. And so we need to try and understand what's happening at each of these phases. And it could be that the opioid system, which is a, um, important for reward and euphoria and pleasure, is important for the rapid part. But the sustained effects, so the plasticity, the learning that happens, is the glutamate part. And that maybe the fact that ketamine has these two systems that it's hitting is actually where the, the magic happens, or the special part of the special kick. So I've told you about a um, uh, few, you know, few of our studies. Um, mainly, we're, we're um, recruiting for this large study. So if you have, um, you know, if you know of anybody who has OCD, who's interested in partnering with us on research, we have this study looking at mechanisms of rapid action of ketamine. Um, we're also looking at new and different, um, I'll get to your um, uh, question. So we also have new, um, uh, drugs that act through the glutamate pathway and drugs that act through the opiate pathway, and we have clinical trials going now. One we're partnering with is a biohaven um, study where there's sites all across the United States, and it's a drug that acts through glutamate, and it could be added on to existing medication. Um, we also have a study of transcranial magnetic stimulation, which we're partnering with Nolan Williams on, um, to see if we can um, target that that region, that thought control circuit specifically, without having the systemic side effects of um, medication. And if we can also shorten the amount of time from months of the current TMS treatment that's FDA approved to just one week. Um, and so some takeaway points, and then I'll, t I'll take a questions. Um, so there are effective first-line treatments for OCD. I've t spent a lot of time talking about research. Hopefully um, I sp spent enough time talking about the wonderful treatments that we currently have for patients. And so we want to make sure that those patients have access to those treatments. Ketamine has promise, um, but it's not ready for prime time yet, I would say. Um, and for those not helped by treatment, I hope I conveyed to you the, the real hope that we have. There's so much... Um, research and exciting developments coming, and I feel like just on the horizon, even with the, the new FDA uh, uh, approval potentially, there are new treatments that are coming online and available. So I wanted to thank my lab, um, and just let you know that if you want to contact us about research studies, you can email us um, at ocdresearch at stanford.edu. 
We also have studies for hoarding disorder um, and resources available. You can email us at clutterhelp at stanford.edu. I also have lots of flyers, so I'm happy to, to, to give those to you or if you're in a clinic, um, just give you a couple of them so you can distribute them. Um, and you can, you know, we, we really need partners. We need folks like you. We need the, the brave individuals who partner with us on research studies. Um, here's my information on Twitter and some references. And so I'll just end there. Thank you so much and take questions. Go ahead. I'm sorry? Oh, yes. Um, so right now we're in year three. Um, so in about two more years, we'll, we'll complete our enrollment. Oh, phase two. Yes, yes, yes exactly. One, one site. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Beth. For anyone to participate in the research, that person has to be local. Correct. <laughs> yeah, for um, it depends on what the study is, but um, you know, it, uh, I I think we're about thirty minute thirty minute drive from Stanford, so anybody who's living in this area is okay. Um, we've have had people who um, you know drive from over an hour away. We've had people co come in from other parts of the country, to you know they they can get a hotel room and you know those kinds of things. So we're, we're, we're open. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. relationship or, or overlap between um, OCD and addiction? Yes, it's a great question. Um, we, um, you know, one can think of um, uh, um, the reward pathway and in OCD, uh, there are thought to be some abnormalities in, in the reward pathway. Um, so those those two things are similar. Um, certainly there's the, the, um, the, the drive, the, 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 the compulsive behavior. But I would say for the most part, individuals with OCD don't tend to um, have um, problems with addiction. We actually tend to find that that doesn't run together. Um, as much as other disorders, certainly I would say people, um, you know, with um, uh, a lot of suicidality, for example, the, the comorbidity or the, the association with substance use is very high. Um, and <clears throat> one of my, my personal sort of thinking about OCD is that um, you know, OCD is also called the doubting disease. And uh, even though you've checked that the stove is off, when you turn away, people kind of have this uncertainty and doubt, have I actually done it? And so they need to check again and the pattern repeats itself. So there really isn't like a signal that it's done. You know, you, you work in a worker, you clean, and then all of a sudden what happens? Like in your brain, you're like, it's done. Well, that signal isn't there. And it's thought that um, reward mechanisms and opiate particular, that system has the sort of satiety or off um, uh, um, that's that that may be impaired somewhat, and we see that drugs that um, block um, uh, opiates worsen OCD symptoms, and and drugs that actually um, boost uh, opiates actually improve OCD. Um, met yeah, yeah. Well, methamphetamine um, uh, and um, and ketamine have a different mechanism of action. Um, they're both substances of abuse, but but they act through different pathways. Yeah, and I w I would say also, you know, ca caution is needed. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd like to find out uh, about the research you're doing on ketamine and OCD, is it transferable to the clutter problems like holding? Because holding is also coming from anxiety, wanting to hold on to. Um, I, I actually, um, when, I, when I give a talk and um, you know, I speak about the work that I do with, with clutter, um, I do have that qu question. Um, it's possible my hypothesis about how it works is, um, that that you know, ketamine has been shown to be helpful in things like um, depression, 
bipolar, suicide. I think one of the common features of all those things is a sort of rumin rumination, this ruminative process, these intrusive thoughts. It's also been shown to be helpful in PTSD. These kind of intrusive thoughts or memories um, and, and that, that there's like a cycle that sort of continues on. And so that's not how I picture clutter um, problems, that it's more of um, an affinity and a, an appreciation, almost like an artistic-like appreciation uh, for objects that are difficult to part with. So I don't have in my mind a model for how ketamine might be helpful for that particular piece. And the treatments that we have, um, the study that we have is um, doing a group-based intervention um, to learn more about um, why, pe why you keep things, why people themselves keep things. And then we have an in-home component where we offer 20 hours of in-home uncluttering. And it seems to be very helpful. Medications, what I found in, in clutter um, in environments is that oftentimes people lose their medications in their clutter. And so I, I haven't found that as a, as a good pathway for that. Okay, so, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go all the way to the back and then come back because I've done some of the, the front row, yeah. Um, this is probably a naive question, but I saw in the PowerPoint when you were talking about frontline treatments for OCD, I thought it's a D-methamphetamine, and I uh, kind of, I was confused about that because, as I understand, methamphetamine is a stimulant, and I didn't, and then when you were talking about, like, the inhibitory effects of ketamine, it, like, seemed a little contradictory, and I was wondering if you could speak to that. Thanks. Thanks for the microphone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's good. A wonderful, wonderful talk. And I, and I think, um, you know, it sort of speaks to, um, we don't, I think one of the challenges is that we don't know what causes OCD. So I think a lot of the medications that have been tried have been done in clinical trials. Um, and, um, you know, things like um, uh, Larry Curran, who's Professor Emeritus now at Stanford, but did a lot of studies looking at either low-dose morphine High dose caffeine, which is a stimulant, um, you know the, the 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 drug that you mentioned as well, um, and they seem they seem to be helpful for OCD. But I, as a neuroscientist and a, and, and a clinician, I don't understand exactly how they're working. But what it is is you know we're not nature isn't carved at its joints. People are different. There may be different kinds of medications that help certain people. And it's really on us to try and identify what causes OCD, what are the mechanisms, and, and what drugs are best for which individual. So we're not there yet. Great question, though. The OCD was, um, especially the neurotransmitter GABA, was increased with the use of um, the use of ketamine, ketamine right? Yeah. And so the question is, um, well, how much was it increased? And um, because the graph did not show a lot of difference between. Uh, it wasn't very much. So it was significant by, you know, the statistical, so we needed to report that. But again, I mentioned I'm a skeptic. And so I, um, there was a lot of noise in when I look at the data. And so it didn't, it didn't give me confidence, like, this is really you know, the, the, the linchpin. And plus it sort of went, it went opposite to my hypothesis. So in fact, I, I, part of the, of the large study is um, using an improved technology um, called um, uh, Mega Press Special. Uh, we're partnering with people at Stanford to be able to decrease the noise and really be able to see, is that GABA signal, signal real? And we're continuing to, so we give um, the infusion while people are in the scanner and they're having real-time um, changes in their neurochemical levels to see if that's true or not. So I'm, I'm hoping that with a larger sample, better technology will be able to answer that question. Got it. But that's the only link that you see between ketamine's effect on the neurotransmitters. Yes, for now. to date. But, um, you know, we're partnering with um, neurosurgeons, we're partnering with um, geneticists, we're partnering with a lot of different people at Stanford. It's a wonderful um, uh, collaborative environment to be able to ask some questions. So when you have um, deep brain stimulation, ha has a humanitarian device 
uh, exception for OCD. And when you, um, when you can put in an electrode to, to, to assess where to put the deep brain stimulation device, you can actually listen to the neurons. Um, you can also you can see how they're communicating and talking with each other, which gives us information. You can even um, uh, re um, uh, sample neurochemicals directly from the brain. Um, and so, so there's a lot of possibilities for investigation. Um, again, you need to be, you know, um, make sure that you have informed consent, um, that, that there's IRB approval, you know, will somebody to consent to, the, to, to that type of procedure when they're having the deep brain device? Feasibility for me is not established yet, but there, there are um, methods to answer that question. As well, in, in um, culture, you can take um, cells um, and you can, um, both in animal models and human models, um, actually be able to test different kind of drugs in cell models to see if there are these changes. And so I think this is kind of gives us a, an opening. I, I like science where it sort of opens up more questions than, than, than answers. And so for me, I have a lot of questions that I want to try and figure out. Um, both in those cellular models, and then and then going closer to to um, what's actually happening. Thank you. All the best. Yeah. Thank you. Good. you. I'll let you decide. <laughs> oh, give it to Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Conditions such as schizophrenia huh? and OCD seem to take place after at a certain maturing le maturing level in the person, like you mentioned before. Yes. Is there any connection between the change in the brain that takes place at, at that part in, in life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wish I knew. I, the, the, the answer is I don't know. But it is so interesting, isn't it, that a lot of um, uh, mental illnesses have that course right in adolescence. And I have... Um, a tw now 12 year old son right now and I can sort of see his brain changing and and how he's interacting with me is changing and, uh, and it's uh, for those of you who have had teenagers like this is it's amazing I, I don't know how you've done it it's very hard <laughs> but it's but there's th there's there's a lot there's a lot of um, of um, there's that time window and I think particularly when um, individuals go from high school to college. It's called like sort of failure to launch, which is in that time period where a lot of the cortical regions and the, um, you know, are being developed and kind of dampened down like the top down regulation for all these more primitive structures and the amygdala and the emotions and the hormones are sort of pushing up, you know, that, that critical window in that period is where some things go, go awry. Um, but I, I, there isn't a study that I'm convinced of like, oh, now I understand what happened or why in that time period. Um, so I think um, the National Institutes of Health um, has a good direction, which is trying to find, um, fund more longitudinal studies over time. So what's happening first, then what happens during this critical period. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll go back. <laughs> My question was pertaining to um, OCD, that your study um, focuses on treating people with OCD using the ketamine. But what about people who have OCD that involves self-harm, like people who pull hair? Or yes. Do you show any improvement with those folks having obsessive mm -hmm. behaviors such as that? And what are those results? Yeah. So um, if, if um, it depends on, um, so what I would say, people that have like repetitive behavior like, like hair pulling and, or skin picking, um, that um, a cluster, um, also called trichotillomania, um, uh, is helped by a sort of a different set of, th of things. Um, one is habit reversal. It's a type of therapy that helps, that helps dampen down those, those behaviors. Um, we haven't had somebody who had specifically just that symptom cluster in for, um, and, and to see what, what ketamine does. So that would be very interesting. I'll have to be on the, on the lookout. Yeah. So how 
unusual is it for someone preteen to start exhibiting symptoms of OCD? Preteen, so I say tw well, 25%, even, 25 percent of people. Well, start. even like a, a six-year-old. Yes. Well, um, so what's interesting um, about this and thinking about the developmental, so a lot of kids with, with um, clutter uh, difficulty, a lot of people have collections. A lot of people have these things like don't step on a crack, break your mother's back. There's a lot of these games and things that a lot of kids have, but not all those individuals will go on to develop OCD, and not all the, all the kids that have collections or affinity for items go on to have um, difficulties and impairment with clutter. Um, so we, we don't know why that is. But a lot of people have traits like that. Yeah. Did that answer your question? I don't know. Or maybe I'll take it offline. Okay. <laughs> Want to go in the back? Or? We'll get to you. Go ahead. Um, from my lived experience, um, I've interesting when you said that uh, step on a crack, break your mother's back. I started doing that in third grade, and uh, what little boy wants to break his mother's back? And that was terrifying to me because um, I took it very seriously. But what I found in um, being hospitalized and telling doctors and um, psychiatric nurses that I had OCD and also anxiety, I actually had a psychiatric nurse tell me that no one's ever died from that. So they didn't really want to take it very seriously. And um, Sorry you had that experience. Yeah, it was, it was, it was very demeaning. Um, and then later on when I tried to actually get a, um, a disability rate for with the VTA, which is our local um, mass transit, they would not give me a discount because of, because of OCD or anxiety. My doctor had to change it and, and, um, and eventually put in depression, which they took that more seriously. Um, now, my illness has put me in the hospital many times in my life, so it's, it's pretty significant. I'd like to know, um, in your studies, do you ever find trouble getting funding for studies with, ACE, with OCD? Because it seems to me things like depression, schizophrenia, bipolar um, might get a little bit more attention. And I also, I'm, I'm taking um, an SSRI, which I was told, oh, well, it's Luvox. And it works wonderful for me. And, uh, and it wasn't until my last doctor actually, she was the first one that ever actually brought this medication up. And um, she was wonderful. I, I really credit her with saving my life. Um, and, uh, but as far as I know, that that was the only SSRI that was specific to OCD, where there's many, many other SSRIs for depression and things like that. Yes. So um, thank you again so much for sharing uh, your lived experience. Um, so I share your frustration. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I say is that, uh, you know, in the media, there are, there is some awareness raised in OCD, but sometimes it gets diminished. And um, one, one of the studies that we did showed that one in seven adults with OCD will attempt suicide in their lifetime. And I, um, you know, there was one patient who really sticks out in, in my mind where she had not been able, like not reached treatment. So on, on average, it's like 10 to 15 years before somebody experiences OCD symptoms and actually gets properly diagnosed. Um, and she uh, had waxing and waning OCD symptoms 
um, she was doing well, she had a baby, and when the baby was born, she just had a flood of contamination, wasn't able to change her baby's diaper. Um, the husband was not, not in the picture, uh, and she, ha she had to make this heartbreaking choice to give up her baby for adoption. Um, and I'm seeing her many years after, but it's just the story is heartbreaking, not having that access. And so I would say thank you for, for sharing that. And I, found, I find often with my own colleagues, people say, oh, why don't you study, you know, other things, you know, that have a higher prevalence or things that, or, 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 or things that you know, are more impactful. And um, when I, I, I've learned to share that, like, kind of thought image because a lot of people don't know what it is and have seen just so much imagery um, that, that, that diminishes it. And so I think the more that we can do, NAMI can do all the work you do to raise awareness um, is very helpful. And um, I, I just don't take no for an answer. So if somebody tells me that, then it's an opportunity for me to educate them. Um, tell them about the wonderful science we're doing. And, um, you know, we get funding from, from NIH and funders and things like that. So um, I think the more good science and the more good work we do, it's sort of then, then people say, oh, wait a second, this is something that, can, that, that you can change obsessions in hours? Like, it just changes how people perceive it. Um, so anyway, you got me a little bit on, on, my, on my, uh, uh, my high horse about it, soapbox, yeah. Um, so the other the other question though you had was yeah. yeah I have been fortunate to, to have funding so um, and, and I try to recruit as many young faculty members to work with me to sort of get more researchers and get more interest and I've been invited um, to speak at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and my topic in January is going to be on OCD. So I'll have all the, uh, you know, leaders there, and I'm going to give my example and and really advocate for that because, unfortunately, um, not just OCD but mental illness in general is very under resourced. So for every 11 new compounds that are being tested in cancer, nine are being tested in neurology, and you know how many in psychiatry? One, one, that is a travesty, a complete travesty. And I'm gonna say that to those people in Switzerland. Um, do you think with the um, recent discovery of the human genome, and I've also heard that um, Stanford in some regions of medicine is using genetically engineered viruses to deliver genetic information into like tumor cells, maybe the brain. Mm -hmm. right? Would that be, is that a possibility that is yes. like in the far future? Yes, uh, it's amazing technology. I would say um, we have some candidate um, genes that we're working with geneticists to be able to test in animal models, but without knowing what causes OCD. I don't keep going back to this, but we, we need to know that. that. That is what will ultimately cure OCD. And so we need to direct our resources to it. Um, I, I believe there are a lot of different ways to de deliver, but we need to know what's the right treatment, what is the right place to give it, and what is the right time to give it. Do you have any idea if OCD is as prevalent, say, in other cultures as in our? I'm particularly thinking maybe of, say, sub-Saharan Africa, places like that. I don't know. Um, I think in um, depression, I, I'm, I'm originally from Puerto Rico, and um, a colleague of mine discovered something called um, uh, um, ataque de nervios, which is like almost like attack of the nerves, which is like a way the individuals in Puerto Rico describe kind of depression and anxiety symptoms. Um, so, you know, I think there could be a lot of different expressions about OCD. It's very interesting. Um, and uh, if we can enlist the partnership of an anthropo um, uh, anthropologist uh, who is 
interested in doing that those kinds of research studies, I'd be game to partner. Um, you have a question? Oh, yeah. I'm okay. interested in if there's any research done on um, OCD and the relationship with the criminal justice system. Hmm. If there's any studies or homeless as we pass Proposition 2, we're going to have housing. And we certainly want a bunch of people coming into the housing that clutter up the housing. Mm. Okay. Oh, it's, so, yes, for, for so, clutter. For, so, for, um, uh, so you know, I mean, hoarding and... Hoarding and, a homeless. You know, like I see them when I clean up the creeks. And, yes. You know, they're hoard, there's huge camps, and I find out it's just one person. Yes. I mean, it's well, amazing. Yeah, certainly the drive to, to, to keep things is very, very strong. And um, I, I got into that area of research because I, I noticed that, you know, f for homeless people, you know, doing the shopping carts, it wasn't, they didn't really, they weren't really packing as if like you would to go on an expedition where you kind of like have one of each item and you kind of pack it really tight and things like that. They had like multiple and duplicates of things. Um, in certain categories, and that made me think, like, oh, is that like, um, you know, they're sort of, it's more of a collecting thing. And it ma made me think, like, are they without a home because they actually were evicted from their homes? And so I started studying, um, uh, talking to eviction prevention agencies and found one in New York City where they said, oh, you're interested in, in clutter? Like, come, you have to help us. And we actually surveyed, and 50% of the individuals who are coming for help with eviction met criteria for hoarding disorder. Um, and so it was, we found this kind of interesting way to be able to identify individuals who were at risk that were willing to get treatment because when threatened with the loss of all of their items, um, they were really motivated for treatment. And um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think, uh, yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. So many wonderful questions. Um, and I'll be here after. Thank you. What a wonderful group.